Great. Thanks, Kirsten. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the ATAR Cloud and Coffee discussion. Again, my name is Chris Oglesby with MorphWorks and my co-host, uh, Bill Hunt with the SBA. Uh, we're excited about uh, the show and uh, our guest today. Uh, before the introductions, as usual, uh, the uh, ATAR Cloud and Infrastructure Working Group is bringing this platform with the goal of bringing lessons learned and ideas to the ATAR community. Uh, our focus will be a conversation uh, about our guest experience, past and present, uh, executing modernization and transformation efforts. A little bit of housekeeping, uh, please make sure everybody is uh, muted. Uh, there is a uh, Q&A portion of, uh, of Zoom that uh, if you have questions, please uh, put those out there and we will get through them uh, in, a, uh, in a timely manner. And so uh, moving into introductions, uh, John Ramsey and I have uh, known each other for, uh, for a bit, but uh, John is the uh, Chief Information Security Officer for the uh, National Food Clearinghouse. Uh, John brings a great perspective to the uh, Cloud and Coffee Forum <clears throat> by bringing, uh, excuse me, a number of different uh, security views from uh, various organizations with very different missions in each organization. And so he's been a part of uh, uh, a number of transformation uh, organizations and in John's words, modernization and security go hand in hand. So um, I'd like to welcome, uh, welcome John today and uh, we'll get, uh, get into, the, uh, into the discussion. So, you know, John, when, uh, when, when we say, uh, Kind of the, the various missions and uh, security and, and modernization can go hand in hand. I, I think that led into a, you know, that you, Bill, and I, and uh, kind of the pre-call having, having a number of different topics to, to talk about. But I think in general, I mean, it, it'd be good to get kind of your perspective when, when you state that. What, what are you, what, you know, what are you trying to get across to, to folks in that, in that, uh, in that perspective? Oh, Chris um, and Bill, thank you both for, for inviting me this morning. Um, and modernization and security going hand in hand. I think the overarching thing, theme of modernization is opportunity. Um, and, and so it's not just an opportunity about modernizing your IT, um, your hardware, your software, your processes. But you know what, this is something where you can, it's an opportunity to modernize security efforts as well. Uh, there's not a vendor out there now that doesn't have a various level of bundling with their modernization efforts. Um, and a good example is AWS or Azure, somebody doing some sort of cloud migration as part of their modernization efforts. You know, it's easy to still use third party applications, but almost all of these modernization efforts now are integrating internal security features. Not only can you save money, but you have an opportunity to really enhance your security posture as well. So it's, it's leveraging everything that the modernization effort has to offer versus trying to, trying to incorporate and integrate your existing processes into a whole new world. Well, let's keep rolling on, on the cybersecurity front, obviously, because that's near and dear to my heart. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of ground to cover there. So, I mean, cloud has changed how we do business, right? Like, um, that goes without saying. It's, it's no longer us just, like, sitting in our little sock, you know, um, hoping that our internal infrastructure doesn't go down. There's, there's a much more wider field to be covered now. Um, how have things changed as you've seen it? I mean, obviously we've seen the rise of, you know, lots of different new security models. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, when we were chatting before, joking with Chris about, you know, we've got tick three now, you know, we've moved towards zero trust and protecting our, our data instead of just the perimeter. Um, how have you seen the field really evolve uh, you know, over the last couple of years? You know, how has that impacted how you look at security? Oh, that, that, that's a great question. 10 years ago, 12 years ago, there's probably not a company in the world that would dream of doing a cloud-based security platform. Everything you do is all about control, having it internal, making sure it runs, making sure that nobody has visibility into what might actually happen into your organization. You know, 12 years down the road, 10 years down the road now, I wouldn't dream of using an on-prem security solution uh, as we've moved with all of our modernization efforts. Um, almost everything you can do now, there is a cloud-based security approach to it. You know, the days of, well, we have to build this whole security stack on-prem from endpoint detection and response to having some sort of uh, NAC implementations to disaster recovery. And I think disaster recovery has been the best thing in the world for modernization efforts is 
I don't have to buy a complete second set of security tools and put it on an on-prem disaster recovery solution. Mm -hmm. I have one cloud-based security solution that addresses my DR site just as if it was an extension of the office. Uh, I'm not duplicating all of those initial costs. So there's, from the savings perspective, it's great. Um, also, from the maintenance perspective, you know, something that's changed in the last 10 years is, you know, initially you put up a security tool, you almost had to have a dedicated full-time employee to monitor and maintain that technology stack, regardless of what it is. And if you had two or three different security tools, and I think most security offices probably have an average of about 15 to 20 security tools, that's a whole suite of people just to maintain something that shouldn't require maintenance. And that cloud-based approach to this and the, modern, the modernization of security is the exact same way. I'm not wasting any time for my staff to maintain anything that's been modernized uh, from a cyber front. You know, all we have to do is ensure we've got the great correct integrations in place. Uh, and then it is off and running. And my team is really focused on day-to-day -day operations and activities on keeping the organization safe versus half of their time making sure something runs right. Or the other half of their time making sure there's a false positive and just irritating the infrastructure team because they're having them do something that's no longer applicable. Uh, so, so from that front, I mean, the security community has evolved tremendously. And it's no longer in an internal team trying to figure out how to implement a security solution. It's just how quick and how far do you want to expand it now? And it's all the flexibility is just phenomenal. And the cost, I mean, there's always been questions on, on cloud. Some organizations say either there's a cost savings, there's not a cost savings. You look at the five year down the road, there's a big cost savings. From the level of effort and safety aspect, cloud-based security is just, it's been phenomenal because we're really focused on stopping the bad guys versus keeping the tools up and running. Mm -hmm. So that we've got a couple of questions here. And I, I think the, the first one from uh, Greg really kind of ties into uh, <clears throat> probably a conversation that we have a lot here on Cloud and Coffee. And so I'll, I'll, I'll read it. And, and, and I think there's a security play, but I, I think this is definitely one that, uh, you, Bill, and I have talked about. So with modernization, are there any uh, guidelines or recommendations to avoid lift and shift and really think about taking advantage of major cloud services, you know, AWS, Azure, uh, GPC? And, and you know, Greg, I think we've, we've talked on previous uh, um, uh, cloud and coffees around kind of the strategy and planning. Uh, and I think, you know, we've talked to John about that. So John, I don't know if you want to take a little, little bit of your approach to, uh, to those kind of efforts. Oh, yeah. It goes back to opportunity. Uh, Re-engineering your processes. If you have a poor on-premise process on how you're using your technology, all you're doing is shifting your poor on-premise process into the cloud. It's still going to be a poor process. I mean, so it, it's an opportunity to really re-engineer how you do business and, and how, how effective it is. And, and I'll use um, Office 365. There's probably a good there's a large customer base that uses Office 365. Um, from a siloed approach, you've got an infrastructure team that does the lift and shift and they move the exchange from on-premise into, into the cloud and they think it's done. From a security approach or from the opportunity approach, you know, there's a whole lot of manual efforts on keeping email safe. It's still the number one attack vector. And there's just between stopping checking links, sandboxes and everything else, but the opportunity, you know, get rid of all of that on-premise security stack dealing with emails and maximize what's in, in Office 365. Um, so, I mean, as far as that lift and shift, you shouldn't lift and shift. It, you know, re-engineer and, and, and use what you can. And people do that with data centers too, if we talk modernization. It's not just about going into the cloud. People go from an on-prem data center into an um, a major data center, an off-premise data center like Equinix or someplace out in Loudoun County. And you, you do something like that. If you just lift and shift your stack and not re-engineer your networking and your routing and everything else, you're just missing out on future cost savings um, because of the little extra planning and diligence to do it during the, during, during the transition. I'm not I sure mean, if that answered the question, but that's, that's how I would look at it. Don't lift and shift. <laughs> uh, 
Well, John, the check is in the mail. I appreciate you uh, right. saying my talking points for me. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, obviously that's the one that I always hit on with people too when we're talking about like cloud at the end of the day. I mean, a lot of people don't do the math and realize government owns all of our own real estate. So we're not paying for that data center in general anyway. So if you're just lifting and shifting and not getting any of these additional capabilities out of it, it's not going to be cheaper for you. So I'm glad that you hit on that. And that kind of ties into the other question we have in the chat here. Um, which is uh, regarding these bundled security products, you know, these add-ons that you get with the cloud services that may save money, um, but are the products as good, you know? And I can say, you know, from where I'm sitting in SBA, we've been, you know, not to sound full of myself here, but um, pioneering, you know, the doing new CDM pilots using existing cloud tools and not the stuff that Sizzle offers um, because we can get more value out of the native tools in these cloud services than if we're buying additional stuff to dump on top. So do you find that uh, they're the products that are in these cloud services, the bolt-ons that come with it, are they as good as the stuff that you see commercially available that are just doing that one thing of like, I'm not gonna name specific products here, but you know exactly who I'm talking about with regard to the monitoring tools. Yeah, so I'm not gonna endorse anybody, but I'm gonna name several products that do their own inter internal stuff. Um, and, and the first one, M Microsoft and Office 365. There is the cybersecurity community is huge. The market just continues to grow and grow, and it's hard to know what is the right level of product for the right level of security. I'm of the firm belief nobody will ever know the security better than the manufacturer of the product themselves. Um, you know, the Microsoft and how they evolved to integrate Windows 10 operating system along with the Microsoft security stack, great. Uh, you look at some of these SIM products that are out there, whether it's IBM's QRadar, Alert Logic, or whoever else. You're not, nobody's going to know how to integrate their product better than the company themselves. Um, info blocks with DNS. You know, that's kind of the hit and miss of, of the world is DNS. Everybody sets up some sort of DNS server and hopes that everything works right until it doesn't. But, you know, they're integrating threat capabilities to look at DNS sinkholing. Um, you know, nobody's going to know how to integrate DNS sync holding with an Infoblox device better than Infoblox. Mm -hmm. uh, just so as, as far as from that aspect, maximize what they have to offer. AWS has a security hub. They have 10 different security products internally built to monitor AWS um, servers and devices and EC2 instances. I mean, you know, the last three years, every time you hear a breach, you hear about it being an AWS S3 bucket that somebody is maintaining their own security on and not leveraging the AWS security. You just, you're just not gonna know the security of the product better than the product manufacturer themselves. So that actually, um, you know, we had a, a little bit of a uh, conversation a couple of weeks ago on here about, uh, you know, remembering to make sure you, you check the box to have the security, right? To make sure that you understand what it is. And, and FedRAMP obviously on the government side you know, brings a lot of that inheritance, right? Which I don't think is any different than if you're on the commercial side. To your point, if you're going to host into in, in an environment, you have to understand what the security, um, you know, the security wrapper, the boundaries, what they're doing with with their environment. Uh, and I, I think, you know, again, back to kind of the the planning and and preparing and and the the broken process. If you have a broken process, you know, on prem, it's not going to get better just moving to the cloud. How do you make sure that you understand what um, those cloud providers are doing and, and the impact to your organization? Oh, I mean, it's, I think we all have undergone some sort of audit or assessment or review or independent reviews. You know, some, some of that is to the point that once you, there's, there's only so much diligence a, a company can do before they get a new product line or a, a new suite of tools. I mean, there, there's a little bit of a base basis once you do your homework and you check Gardner, Forrester, or whoever else, that it's a sufficient product. And you, you can only do so much limited testing because you, you don't know the product in the first place. That's why you're going to something new to improve your process. But at, at some point in time, you've got to bring somebody independent that's outside to really scrub and look and see what you're doing. So, uh, so we are a Microsoft customer. Um, we leverage many of their security opportunities. And, and we're not gonna take Microsoft at their word that this is the way to do security. Uh, what we did though, we have an independent validator that comes in and, and our pen tests are a little bit different than some organizations. We don't have a series of controls that they check. We give them targets. Here's our, here's our critical data. Can you access it? I don't care how you do it. Can you access it? 
uh, our domain controllers? Can you access it? Can you touch it? And that's validating that those actual security tools, uh, and it, it might be the, the product lines and the security permissions within the application itself too, can they actually reach it? I mean, so there's a level of diligence that, and trust that you have with the manufacturer, uh, and you hope it's not just a complete marketing slick. But then, you know, during your testing of these new products, you've, you've got to put it in there that there's a security check that it, it's doing what it says it does. Carrying off on that a little bit, you know, one thing that um, uh, I would say, I'm not going to say we necessarily struggle with because I'm not going to post them on the hook, but a lot of agencies struggle with is, you know, with a lot of these new cloud solutions, you know, you're talking about SaaS and pass based infrastructure, right? Um, which means you're not necessarily in control of all of the patching. You're not necessarily in control of, more importantly, new feature rollouts, right? So how do you stay on top of that? You know, we've got a lot of these providers, you know, you mentioned Microsoft and some of the others um, that are constantly deploying new features, you know, and they kind of go straight into your environment. And all of a sudden you have whatever security holes they decided to introduce along with it. Um, how do you stay on top of all the constantly evolving changes, uh, you know, that, that come with all of these shiny new technologies? That's, that, that's an excellent question. And it, it's, not, it's not an easy answer. Um, the way that I've done it in my organizations is really looking at the criticality of the device that's being patched. Um, in my last two org organizations, and I'll use user endpoints as an example, um, we average probably 96 hours of having all of our user endpoints across the globe patched. And that's because there's a level of trust that we know that Microsoft typically tests a good 30 days before they deploy a patch. And if we really have a standardized image that's out there in desktop, I'm not going to have an issue with one device. I'm going to have an issue with all of, all of the devices. So our desktops, the criticality of one of those going down isn't as high. So we patch and expedite the patching and the upgrades and the software upgrades, um, usually within four to six days. And then, of course, we have servers that are more mission critical that there's uh, any issues. And we have a service disruption. We have compliance issues. We have regulators watching us. Uh, those were a little bit more diligent and we test. Um, but, you know, that is an ever evolving problem is that sometimes the software pushes are coming out too frequent. And in part of that's part of your acquisition process, too, when you're looking at new, new tools or modernization efforts. You know, one of the key questions you should have for any company is how often are you pushing releases? If somebody's pushing releases four to six times a year, holy crap, how can they test major releases that often? Uh, versus, you know what, we do it twice a year and we pick the top 10 that we want and minimize the impact to our customers. And that's kind of the, the alternate approach. All right, that's the company I'm more inclined to go with because I know all of the effort and legwork behind the scenes once we get those is going to be minimized. So kind of building on the, the, the evolving change, right? That, that's within the, the, now the new cloud environments. <clears throat> I, you know, I think one of the things that, that uh, you know, we see is you, you need to understand that the, the pace at which they're going is not the same pace at which you used to go, right? So you've, you've, moved, to, you've moved to the cloud and, and the cloud technologies are, are moving at, at that pace that, you know, from just a modernization standpoint, you need to think about, but, how do you guys then evolve from a training and understanding of the, the products and change? Do you guys have a, or in your, in your history, uh, not just, just where you are now, but in your history, have you kind of broken it out that, okay, we're not gonna roll out anything new until you know, we have people that are, that are skilled on the product, the, the, you know, the, 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 the new changes, or, or how do you guys look at, the, look at that evolution? This, this might sound wrong, uh, but I think some of the cloud providers are making it easier and they're giving customers less choice on what they decide to implement and roll out or not roll out. Uh, kind of a blessing in, in disguise because what, what you said, Chris, is it's a really hard decision. Um, and you'll never get a whole organization to agree on what to roll out and what not to roll out. You know, if they're rolling out a feature that includes security enhancements, but there's no infrastructure or application or business line benefits, you, you know, you've got that internal conflict that you've then got to fight and champion uh, versus somebody that says, you know, we're going to roll this out. You don't have to turn it on. You can keep it disabled and, and then figure out when down the road that you want to do it. Uh, and that's kind of the trend that we've seen with a lot of, a lot of the cloud services is that they're being rolled out regardless 
and sometimes they're disabled. Uh, and then they're just notified that, you know, you can turn this on at your convenience when, when, when you want to. Now, the problem is there's a whole lot of minor changes for most of these cloud services that are coming out all the time. So we have dedicated people that's, for lack of better words, a subject matter expert on this product line, that they're watching these notifications and then kind of making those decisions if we enable something or not. And then we do the typical change management process. I mean, I certainly prefer when uh, it's an option to enable versus the things that just magically show up in the waffle and now you have mm -hmm. to support it, um, <clears throat> which is always fun. Uh, those, are, those are great Mondays. Um, but kind of digging down on that a little bit there, um, you know, obviously having people dedicated to like making sure on the security side that like they're up to date on all the features and everything, but how are you keeping the workforce up to date? Um, so, I mean, we're getting all of these new features. And so some of them are customer facing, right? Like, sure. uh, again, I'll just call out like Teams, you know, like everybody's getting Teams deployed. So Teams has new features and new ways of interacting, you know, every couple of weeks, you know, um, Slack, the competitor to Teams just rolled out, you know, their new uh, workspaces thing, whatever they call that. And I'm sorry, I don't remember the name. Um, so you both have the side of, you need to keep your customer base up to date on these technologies you're rolling out. And also internally, you've got your IT staff that need to know all of the whiz bang new features, you know, like your Kubernetes dockerization of your container stack, coin, whatever they call it this week, you know. Um, how are you dealing with those two sides of it, keeping your customer base up to date and your internal staff up to date in a way that is sustainable and meets your trading budget? Uh, training budget. That's always an, that's always a good conversation too. Um, we can get to that too if you want. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I'll tell you, I've got three people on speed dial, for lack of better words, that I have strong partnerships with in the organizations I've worked at. I've always had a really great relationship with the legal officer or general counsel, just because if there's something that we want to deploy from a security front there's usually some sort of legal implication that we want to make sure that we're aligned. Mm -hmm. um, the infrastructure chief, uh, infrastructure director has always been critical too because this is a person more than likely is gonna have to maintain whatever it is that's being deployed out there or integrate it. Um, and then the other one, and a lot of people don't necessarily value this relationship as much as they should, is that marketing and corporate communications chief. As an IT guy, I am not a marketer. I am not a communicator. I know what I want and how I want to do it. And I've got the soft skills to communicate that. But I don't necessarily have the extreme beneficial skills of translating IT language into what the staff can understand and appreciate. Um, so I have always partnered with our internal communications teams, our marketing teams, our corporate communications teams. So at the same time that I'm starting an IT, um, an IT value-added project, I'm also building that communication strategy at the same time. Um, and so, and, and that's critical. And then depending on how your organization does training, um, we, just like many other organizations, use Skillsoft, LinkedIn Learning. You, you know, we include that as part of the communication package to at least allow people to get familiarization with the product before it comes out. Mm -hmm. um, and so that way they're not completely blindsided when, when it does. Uh, but more importantly, the communication strategy is probably just as critical as the implementation. And it doesn't mean you send one message out and that's it. You're sending out multiple messages from multiple fronts to make sure that the message is there. You know, Patch Tuesday, um, not only do we have it so it's automated regardless, but you know what, come Wednesday morning, I'm sending an all staff message to everybody saying, hey, you know what, Patches came out yesterday. You might see this on your device, it's gonna happen. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they have an option of not having a security patch deployed, but they're now part of the process of engaging and including those security features. So if we ever have something that's out of band and I send out that note, people are taking action. And, and it's a great feeling. It's not because we have a good security program, because we have a strong marketing and communication plan that goes with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you get to really meet your customers. I mean, through using like multi-channel, the lunch and learns, the video series, uh, viral TikTok dance videos to get the word out there, you know, about the features. But you got to meet them where they're at. No, you no, know? Bill, your, uh, your, your TikTok dance video was, uh, was the best. <laughs> I am not on TikTok for anybody who's listening. It's not a thing. I'm not a youth. Right, exactly. So Bill, if I can throw this out there too. So something that we built uh, in my organization is a security ambassador program. 
So it, oh. it's not just about getting the word from the top down. Mm -hmm. We have a group of representatives throughout the organization that also disseminates our messages from the bottom up. So we've got the message coming from two different directions to really emphasize support and, and listen to that water cooler conversations that's the bulk of, of the communications in any organization. So they really help driving that plan too. And I just had to throw that out there because a lot of times people think communication is just somebody sending out a message. Now you've got to figure out the different directions to send that message. Mm -hmm. So how, how uh, to the water cooler, uh, just, just and, and Greg, I see your question and we'll definitely get to it. Um, how is that working in the virtual environment with the security ambassador? It's, it's working great. Um, so and I'll use fishing campaign exercises. Many of our organizations, we do some sort of fishing exercise where a team will send out test fishes to see how many people click on it. Because of our ambassadors, our click rate went from 23% about 15 months ago to less than 4%. Hmm. It's not because of us doing the training. I mean, that's part of it, but they're emphasizing behind the scene, hey, you screwed up, you did this. And they're already integrated in various virtual team forums with, with these various entities within the organization. They're a lot more connected to the staff than I ever will be. Um, so it is, we've noticed no difference or change, Chris. In, in fact, I think it's just facilitated the conversations because they have more direct access to a group of people at one time versus going to the actual water cooler. Yeah, outstanding. So I'm uh, going to pick up on uh, Greg's question here, and I definitely want to take that communication thread to uh, the acquisition because I, I know your history on uh, on that as well. And but uh, so uh, Greg has a, a question here that um, basically they're a you know research facility that needs to put uh, uh, IT security guardrails in place. Um, it reminds me of my bowling game, Greg. I, I need those as well, but. Uh, uh, and ultimately give the key car keys to the researchers and, and take advantage of uh, the, you know, the as a service platforms. So it's, it's the, the balance between, you know, security and freedoms, uh, any recommendations on uh, reference architecture templates uh, to ideally prepackage secure solutions versus giving the researchers a blank canvas. Yes, I've got lots of ideas. Uh, <laughs> You know, and it's not only my organization here, my previous organization where I was assistant with the U.S. House of Representatives, there's 435 members of Congress that all have the constitutional authority to act on their own behalf, and they have their own freedoms on how they communicate to their constituents. Um, and you're in an organization where almost every email has to be opened, and every single aspect of research has to happen because you can't restrict how their constituents can communicate with them. So the question is, how do you open up so much freedom and still keep them safe and protected? Because you know, the more you increase security, the less the functionality of the applications are, and the more the functionality of the applications, the less the security. Um, so some of that is being creative, and some of it's looking at attack vectors. Uh, so we're all familiar with FISMA. We're all familiar with authorizations to operate. We're familiar with compliance requirements. We all have to meet those, those are nice, but focus on threat avenues. So when, when you know the major threat vectors coming into an organization is email or web, you know, focus on solutions that will really touch, touch on um, those aspects. And I'm, I'm gonna use email and I'm shifting in my head a little bit here, so bear with me. So email is an example. You know, you want people to receive email anywhere in the world, but how do you do that? You get an application that checks email at several layers outside of email. And that might not make sense, but there's cloud service providers that can integrate with your email services that does an initial scan first and they can clean that email and then send it if something is wrong. So it's really finding those solutions at the perimeter and the outside layer that once it comes inside your organization, they pretty much have a free check to do what they need to do. And Greg, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but it's it's this is where you can do security overkill and it can backfire on you if you do too much. Um, it's finding those solutions that allow those freedoms and, and they're out there. The security community now is larger than it ever was before. And you know, these aren't questions that aren't solved anymore. There's companies that have already addressed them. Yeah, and I, but I think tying that back to your communication and 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 that piece, right? That it's one of the big things that we talk about at ATARC and 
uh, you know, definitely a, a big part of, of our uh, corporate uh, corporate culture and approach is is that advocacy, right? You can't, you know, it, it is a change management, right? Everything right now at the pace at which it's evolving, it's it's changing, you know, at a at a pace that it, it all is change management all the time, right? And so, um, just expecting, um, you know, I think Greg, from the standpoint of expecting that it's there's an easy button. I would say, you know, uh, and encourage that, you know, the, the advocacy and pulling people in early um, on those conversations uh, as you kind of set up the guardrails, right? Because I, I think it is good to have, but you might have to have different guardrails, right? For, for this team, it might be a little bit broader. For this team, it might be a little bit narrower uh, in, in how you kind of uh, set up the approach. So uh, definitely a, a, a good question. And thanks yeah, and, and part of that, part of that approach is the social framing of, of security. You know, it's no longer, you know, the last 15 years, everybody's always said security is your responsibility, everybody's responsibility. You know, and the implication was if you weren't secure, you're responsible and accountable. That's not the way that that should be framed socially. What, what it is, is that, you know what, we want to give you a bayonet. We want you to help us fight the fight to keep us safe. We want you part of the winning team and do this and this and this. We understand your business need and you can make that happen but help us fight the fight when you do see an anomaly. Uh, allow the tools to do what they're designed to do versus turning them off or pushing them to the backside. So this whole thread kind of, I think, ties in nicely to the, the next question, which um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to sanitize a little bit here because obviously we're not going to have you comment on the policy of another agency that's outside the scope of what we can talk about today. Um, so looking towards, you know, the, the logging side, obviously CISA talks a lot about like, you know, logging being the critical component of security. This is how we get visibility into our tools, right? Um, but obviously the different cloud tools that are provided have different levels of security based on the licenses that you pay for, um, you know, and most notably, you know, uh, the, the commenter here mentions uh, O365, which, you know, 98% of government is using right now. And depending on what license you pay for, you get different levels of logging and visibility. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that balance? And I'll also add Bill's personal like gripe on this is also when you're increasing that logging, that's increasing your cost to store, manage, maintain, and view that logging. So wh where do you find that proper balance between every event, every single thing that you could ever possibly look at that you're logging and keeping in a cold archive forever and ever and ever due to some weird records management policy versus you know the actual level of security that is necessary to maintain the organization's security? So, uh, excellent question. And, and this kind of ties back into earlier, what you don't do when you shift into the cloud is a lift and shift of your current processes. Because um, there, there is a cost. There is a cost to every single transaction, every single processing power that happens, every type of access that goes into it. Um, and, you know, so there's some legwork making sure that you're only logging what you need to log. Um, and one, it's one, it's a best practice. Uh, and because if you're just blanket doing a blanket approach and logging everything, that's a huge cost and it builds up quick. And it, you know, the reality is what are you gonna do with that much logs anyways? So my current organization, we have about 3 billion security related events a month, um, which is quite a bit. And that actually weeds down to about a hundred items that get a tier one look at, and then a tier two, maybe we actually have 20 events a month that we investigate because our processes have optimized what needs to be reviewed. Um, so with that said, 3 billion events seems like a month. I mean, seems like a lot, but if you're only keeping them on a 30 day retention, it's not that much because our requirement is 12, I mean, is 12 months for anything that we have to investigate and review. So if you're popping something in and popping it right back out, your cost is minimized. Um, and, and this kind of goes back into everything that a CISO or a chief or a director does you know, you're, you're not a technical expert, you're really a program manager. So when you modernize, you're looking at cost, you're looking at budget, you're looking at schedule, as well as the, uh, the implementation of whatever you're doing. So from the log aspect, you really have to understand what you're collecting and, and why. Um, another fallacy that happens out there all the time is people maintain all of their transaction logs. That's good if you need to maintain your transaction logs, but unless you're looking at performance issues of applications, you probably don't need to do that. And if you're looking at performance issues, you don't need all the security events when you're looking at performance issues. So it's really understanding what you're collecting and then more importantly, and, and we're, we all fall victim to it, we don't decommission or uh, purge our data when we need to purge, purge it. Uh, 
if you speak to a chief legal officer or any general counsel, the first thing they're going to say is the longer you keep it, the more discoverable it is. So there's just a cascading, cascading effects of keeping stuff longer and not collecting just what you need. Right. So um, tying back to kind of the communication and uh, strategy and, and, and acquisition, uh, you, you come into uh, uh, transformation situations um, in a number of uh, organizations um, in the time that I've known you. Um, and so kind of curious, the, uh, uh, the best way the, you know, that you approach, um, you know, approach these from the standpoint of budget, being able to to acquire and and even now in the in the cloud world the you know the acquisition is still a little bit you know funky both from a government side as well as a commercial side and even on the you know kind of in the, the quasi world in which uh, you know which uh, you've been uh, you, can, can you talk through kind of the you know the lessons learned that you've had things you've kind of bumped into because I I know that uh, uh, you you've had some uh, unique situations that you've uh, you've been able to, to kind of power through with uh, with some approaches. Yeah, it, it, at the end of the day, it's all about people um, and partnerships and, and relationships. Um, I have, you know, I mentioned the marketing team and the general counsel and, and the infrastructure teams. Everywhere I've been, I have always worked with the contract officers. I've always worked with the acquisitions director. And it wasn't me working with them trying to push one of my products. It's me working with them, making their contracts more secure so they understand the security implications of contracts, which just really facilitated any of the acquisitions that I had to push forward. Because by that time, when I'm, when I'm submitting something to be purchased, you know, they already have the confidence in what I'm submitting is something that's required because I, I'm meeting all the requirements that I helped them draft for it as a general blanket uh, clause for all the contracts. So that relationship has always been the, the big item uh, and then secondly, modernization isn't a one-time deal. It, you know, it's not just about moving to the cloud and your modernization efforts are done or consolidating your desktops from 80 global locations down to two because it's a shared service. Modernization efforts happen every year. So even if you don't have anything identified, when, when you do your budget forecasting, include light items for modernizing. You might not have specific items, but you know general areas you're gonna modernize you're gonna move something into the cloud. You know, you're gonna need technical assistance in the cloud. Um, what I have never done, Chris, was propose a new project in the current fiscal year. Um, everything has always been forecasted with line items moving forward. And, and most of us know that already. And, and we've done a lot of the budgets with the government to understand that, but it's really, you know, practicing what you're preaching at that point in time so whenever you come into that new budget year and you've already got the relationships with the contract officers and you've got the relationship with the budget officer already, when you've got these line items moving forward, they already understand why you're doing it and they're less likely to question it. Now, now some stuff uh, with the acquisitions regulations, you can't get around. You, you know, for, you've always got to do the probably the typical uh, sourcing to three different uh, competitive vendors, sole sourcing, you know, that's just best practices. But when, when, when you do that, it should facilitate that conversation. And, and we all go through the continuing resolutions in October. I mean, so that's a perfect planning time as far as your budget's already been approved on the 1st, you can't spend until March. You've got six months of incorporating all of your planning to implement in March uh, to have this built out by the, by the rest of the year. And I think the last important thing is, and a lot of us fail to do this, is you've got to deliver on what you're budgeting for too. If you're putting in a line item to, to address something, make sure that if, if you don't meet it on one modernization effort, you meet it on something. There's so much in there that I would uh, love for us to unpack a little bit here. You've, you've just kind of like whirlwinded through like a lot of my hot button issues. And there's three pieces in particular I'd like to tear apart here, uh, but let's take it one at a time, Chris, if you'll uh, permit my filibuster, if you will. Um, so, the first one for me that you kind of touched on that I think is, is absolutely critical is like your acquisition supporting your acquisition team, right? Um, you know, you talked about like IT modernization is, you know, not a one-time thing, which uh, regardless of what presidential cycle we're in, regardless of what buzzword we're using, you know, is EGOV and then business intelligence and, you know, now IT modernization, and we keep changing the phrases, but it's the same thing, right? And uh, for the philosophy nerds that are, that are listening to the audience, both of you, you know, I like to talk about this in terms of like Zeno's paradox, you know, you've got the 
Achilles chasing the rabbit and to get there, you have to go half the distance. Then you have to go half the distance and you never actually catch up um, because IT modernization is always a journey to like follow that lead. Can you talk a little bit about how you approach that from an acquisition standpoint and most specifically, um, how you deal with it from making sure that your acquisition team understands the things that you're buying and how we're buying them. Because obviously we've moved from, we're gonna buy some servers and we're gonna stick them in a room and you know those are gonna you know, amortize over time and you know we're gonna get our costs very different now for paying for things basically like a utility. And we may not know what like our cloud costs may be due to traffic as a result of a pandemic and people flooding our website. Not that that hasn't happened to any of us here. Oh, it, it, in the purest sense, it goes back to an IT person ensuring that he or she doesn't talk IT to a non-IT person. Uh, you know, the contracting people, uh, contract officers are, are great. They know their job better than anybody. And God bless them, you're going to pay me to be a contract officer because they know every line of a 300-page contract, um, like their life depended on it, and, and, and it's great. But at, at the end of the day, they don't know security. They don't know IT. So the reality is we become salesmen. We've got to sell it. They have to understand it. I mean, they're not the approving authority on the acquisition. They're the approving authority on the contract for it. But you know what? You want them to be part of that fight. Um, I mean, so it's, it's really going down to ma making sure that they understand how it benefits them. You know, and that's a classic, what's in it for me? Let them understand what's in it for you. You've got a contracting program now that's on premise. And you know what? And every time that you boot up your device, and your device takes 10 minutes to boot up because it's doing security group policy objects and security transitions and updates. That sucks. It just does. But, you know, if you phrase that, you know, we're going to change your technology so it's a, a cloud-based desktop and it boots up immediately and you can access it anywhere in the world without worrying about taking your laptop home every night. Well, holy crap, that's, that sounds kind of nice. And how much is that? You, you know what, $50 a user a month for a year? You know, that's not that much. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's translating and having them understand that. But you, you know what? The relationship has to be sincere too, though. I mean, it, it is a give and take. They're going to say, John, you can't do that because of this. Well, what can I do? Well, if you take it from this approach and, you know, you take another two months to do this, you know what? Then you can probably get what you want. Well, if I'm planning 12 months out for the next fiscal year to do my project, you know, those acquisition, what we perceive as acquisition delays versus acquisition requirements, they're not as bad as they seem if you incorporate that as part of your process to get what you need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So are you taking that, just to kind of thread into that a little bit more, so you're, you're taking that, uh, that, that communication and advocacy that, that help, help them understand what's in it for them to an outcome-based approach versus just a point-in-time uh, problem solving. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's and, and everything we do from a modernization effort isn't necessarily about problem solving, but how are we making our world better for the next five years until the next modernization effort? I mean, technology, what did, I think technology doubles every two to three years. I mean, so that modernization is always happening. I mean, that's the whole core of refresh cycles for hardware devices. <laughs> we, we know the technology changes, but yeah, it, it, it's not about problem solving. Well, sometimes it's about problem solving. <laughs> But for, for your acquisitions person, though, they usually have a fairly solid application. They just want to be able to access it and work anywhere. Mm -hmm. So there's, a, again, there's so much here to, to, to dig into, and I'm trying to make sure that we can cover all of it in the time that we have. Um, the budget. Obviously, that is the, the, the linchpin of all of this, you know. And so we've got these, I'm going to try and tie in the, the question, the, the, the comments here that we have. Um, you know, how do you make sure that you have all of the funding needed to do all of this stuff when we have leadership from on high for the last 40 years saying that IT is going to save us money and we can keep, you know, squishing down those IT budgets, you know, and we've done a great job. We've gone uh, in the last 10 years from spending $2 billion a year to $90 billion a year. So we're really getting those numbers down effectively. Um, but how do we make sure that we are equipped as agencies to do more with less? Um, you know, what, funding resources are, you know, like that you all are interested in taking care of or taking advantage of, um, you know, in the comments, you know, uh, one person is asking about uh, DHS's CDM Defend. 
Obviously, we have um, working capital funds at most agencies now, thanks to the, the MGT Act. We have the TMF fund, which it sounds like they're trying to plus up to add $9 billion to this year. Um, you know, but that's kind of a payday loan, so probably not the best one for all agencies. Um, you know, how do you make sure that you have the critical budgets necessary, educate all the way up to senior leadership that these things need to be invested in and that we need to spend more money on IT? Um, and what other flexible methodologies are you all taking advantage of, you know, to make sure that you have the budget you need to do this stuff? That's, that's a lot of questions into one. Uh, I know, and uh, you know, you can just cover the ones you want to talk about and ignore the rest. I was gonna, I was gonna pile on, and and when you're doing that, how do you build in the uh, kind of the, the fire drill uh, budget? I mean, how do you build yeah. in into that a, a risk, right? So from a security standpoint, if there is you know, an, an issue, are you giving up something uh, in the future to solve a problem today? So just it, it probably kind of all is in the same kind of planning and and understanding what's available conversation. No pressure. Yeah. None at all. We have 15 uh, minutes if you need it. So <laughs> yeah, so you can, you can do it. Um, so first and foremost, budget planning doesn't start four to six months before the end of the fiscal year. Budget planning starts the first day of the new fiscal year. And if, if people aren't looking at it from that approach, it's they're, they're going to have a harder time when they're asking for money. I mean, I, I start the really the communication and the salesmanship, you know, that first day that, you know, this is what we need. And every opportunity that I have to emphasize that for the next three to four months, I'm emphasizing it. Um, and then some of it's on, on how you craft your budget. I've never lost money in, in budgets. Um, I've had to reduce some stuff, but I've never felt impact. And, and what I mean by that, we all know every year our budgets are, we're going to be asked to cut them 5%, 4%, what, whatever the crisis of the year is. It, it comes across organizations. Um, I always have line items that I know are nice to haves, uh, and they're intentionally in there as nice to haves. And if they get approved, great. If I'm asked to cut my budget from 5 to 10%, you know what, I'm gonna cut those nice to haves because I know there's no impact versus this is what I really wanna do. You know, if I can implement a, a $200,000 closed caption television, that's really nice and will enhance our security, but I know our existing ones will work fine. So some of that stuff, I don't wanna say you've got to have creative budgeting, but when we're always told about doing the zero-based budgeting and make every single dollar count, the world we live in doesn't allow us to do the zero-based budgeting because we are cutting stuff. We are, we do have crises and fire drills throughout the year. It, it, it's making sure that you've got line items in there that you can sacrifice without impact uh, in order to make that happen. Um, now, now with that said, and I'll go back to one of my fundamentals, I have never ever implemented a new project in the fiscal year that I'm working in, mm -hmm. never. Um, everything is always a year out. Uh, and, and that helps from a couple of benefits. One, every time I get those vendor calls at the end of their monthly cycle or quarterly cycle, I'm able to tell them, hey, all my money's already tied up. You know, contact me in, in, in July or August to make sure we get you in the next budget cycle and we can plan something. Um, but more importantly, and, and all of our staffs are overworked and, and I'm a firm believer we're overworked because there's so much to do with modernization from every aspect. And it's easy to preach about process re-engineering and don't lift and shift, but at the end of the day, somebody's doing that work. It gives them time to focus and actually implement and deliver on, on what you're asking for from, from a financial aspect. Um, so from an acquisitions and budget perspective, I, you know, that formulation, it shouldn't start four months at the end of the year because that last four months, everybody's frantically spending the year's worth of money that they weren't allowed to spend until, the, until it was released. Um, but you know, your budget should be pretty much done by day 90 in a new fiscal year on exactly what you wanna do for the follow-on year. And a lot of it's anticipating. You, you know there's gonna be a modernization effort. You know you've got something that you want to change. Forecast for the next three to five years, you know, year one, I'm changing out my firewalls. Year two, I'm gonna change out my desktop, um, my desktop security aspect. You don't necessarily need to identify the specific tool um, that you're going to use or implement or acquire, but you've got to put something in there that gives you the flexibility on getting the money now for situations you're not able to anticipate down the road, uh, but you're anticipating a situation will happen. And I answered some of all that you asked. I, I try to 
I try to re reengage there to go back to the initial conversation. Oh, I think that's I think that's good, and and uh, you know I I I think the you know the the opening statement that you made right that you have fundamentals that you 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 kind of approach each each year with right, and you have you have those 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 core um, uh, kind of work work ethics that that you don't kind of veer from that that allow you to create. I think in each of the organizations you've gone into a rhythm that, you know, it's not that it's going to be, you know, impactful the, the, the first 30 days, but within six months, it starts to, you know, starts to get set into to the, the current organization. You know, I, I believe that, you know, the, the key that, um, you know, that you, you touched on, though, is that planning and understanding, and it's the, you know, the, the and, and what we should all be doing, right? The, the nice to have, the, the need to have and, mm -hmm. and whatnot. So that way, if there is a fire drill, you know, that you can you can pull something off and go, okay, well, that's just gonna have to wait, right? That was, that was something that we really wanted to do, but, you know, it, it's just gonna have to wait. And having having that that understanding, I think, is mm -hmm. key because then depending on what you're doing, right, will impact whether or not that, that nice to have is even a need to have anymore. Right? Does it does it become uh, does it does it in, in, in you know increase in that? So um, so I guess it, to to get to my rambling when you're when you're looking at those, how are you prioritizing um, that list of of nice to have to need to have? Because you know again at the speed you know technology if you if you move to the cloud, right? We're not in that two to three year window anymore. We're in kind of a you know, six to twelve month window of, of changes. How do you how do you start to balance that? Because you almost don't know what's going to come at you, right? In in you know, in six months from when you start planning, or three months from when you start planning, that it's kind of like, oh crap, that all of a sudden became a need to have because of what what changes were here. So is that something you review monthly, quarterly? How do you how do you kind of work through that? So I I, I do a few different things, Chris. Um, one, for every product I have, um, I always include a three to 5% professional services line item to support it. Um, and, and, and that professional does services it. company. I appreciate that. That's good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Only uh, three to 5%. Okay. <laughs> well, and, 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 I'd, ask to, I'd ask you to put more aside for my, uh, for my brethren in the, uh, in the marketplace, but, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll work with that. <laughs> And, and I think that 5% is a cost that's out there floating between Gardner and Forrester to maintain a product. You know, it's usually 5% of the product cost in order to maintain it throughout the year. So I've got the justification to maintain it. Um, so I include a 5% professional services cost for all of my products because they're cloud-based. It's, it's not like there's a whole lot of on staff that I need to do to maintain it. I might have to bring in expertise and I don't waste my team's time using that. Now, if, if I have a really strong cloud solution in place, the odds of me using that 5% professional service cost is probably nil. So if push comes to shove, I have an opportunity to kill that line item. You know, it's, 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 it's a nice to have. It's only critical if something happens, but when you've got five or six different cloud solution providers for different services, I've got a nice chunk of money that I've got the flexibility to pull in and out uh, on how I need to do that. Um, and then I always include, I, I don't want to say a generic line item, but yeah, kind of generic, such as technical assistance or technical services. And justification is I'm not going to waste $50,000 of my staff's time when I can spend $20,000 on bringing a professional services person in, regardless of what the situation is, to troubleshoot that. Now, the first year, you might find yourself using that $20,000, but as your processes get built and refined, year two, year three, and year four, that 20,000 becomes 10,000, becomes 3,000. And now I've got a nice 20K cushion if I've got to cut something or if I need to repurpose it to something else for that fire drill that happens. So some of it's just anticipating that situations are going to happen and, and where can you shift that? And then something else I'll throw out there too. We all have been through budget cuts and, and budget sweeps. They, they happen. Um, this might sound bad, but the easiest way to avoid that budget sweep and that budget cut, don't wait till the end of the year to spend your money. 
I mean, the, the moment you're able to spend and get your acquisitions in place, I hate to say it, it's almost a competition against the rest of the organization. Um, if you've got it forecasted to have this done in January and, you know, there's a lot of technical issues and I just can't get to it in January and I might get to it in February. And the reality is March, I start the acquisition and then May I'm getting it. There's a lot of time between January and May for something to get cut. And if you have done an authorized acquisition and you purchased your stuff as soon as it's released and you're able to, and your cloud subscriptions are easy examples, you, you know you're going to renew them. Have them set in December or January so, so the moment the continuing resolution is over that you can push the trigger and get the money spent. Mm -hmm. You still have your cushions if something happens, um, but you know what? You're not worried about cutting down a service that you've already planned for and budgeted for. Okay, and just just for my own personal, your beginning year fiscal year is when, so I should call you to use that five percent professional services fee. <laughs> December twenty sixth. That's for my <laughs> after Christmas. <laughs> I was don't of... ever call a government employee on December twenty sixth. <laughs> official position here, right? Um, exactly. So. We've only got a couple of minutes left, but I did want to ask you one one final thought here. So, um, you know, in just a minute or two, if you can summarize your your many many thoughts on it. Um, obviously, you know, we have a new administration. We're seeing um, you know some shifts and some changes. IT still seems to be a major priority for the new administration. We're seeing a lot of like former USDS people putting being put into leadership positions. Former ATF people being put into leadership positions. We're seeing um, a lot of uh, budget uh, uh, line item ideas here that are gonna be billions of dollars in IT modernization funds potentially for agencies. Um, where do you see things going over the next couple of years and what are you hoping for towards the future uh, around IT? Specifically either around like technology policy, what, what are you excited about? <laughs> There's always challenges with IT, but I think the reality of IT is, and we all know it, it's not going anywhere. Um, the demand only increases. Um, the expectations increases. Everything is tied back to IT. So even with the change of administration, it's not like IT is going to take a hit. Some organizations might take a, a budget hit. But IT is full force. IT is still the number one cost avoidance that organizations go to in order to save money three to five years down the road. Uh, the irony is within three to five years, they've got to implement something else because technology changed again. Um, but I mean, that's the exciting part about it is because the government is so much more open to cloud now and these modernization efforts. And it's almost a demand and expectation to modernize. It's no longer an option. It's, I mean, we really don't have to defend why we want to modernize. We're almost being told that we have to. But it just makes you know every IT professional out there that much easier knowing that, well, we're told to do it. We have to do it. You don't want to give me the money to do it. Then, OK, then we as an organization needs to defend it. It's no longer that CIO defending, you know, we can't do this because we, we don't have the money. We're getting graded on this. <laughs> yep. so we have to do it i mean so i i'm excited that the support for it continues to grow uh back in 2003 when um fisma came out you know organizations were just flabbergasted how, how do we implement all the security that's being required and we don't have the money to do it i mean so it was it was really hard to do that's that's not the case anymore it, it's, it's great it's that's exciting uh because it's, it's only getting better Excellent. 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 Well, uh, just uh, John, I want to say uh, thank you for the time. We've got uh, a little, little um, a few minutes left. Uh, the, the one of the things I do want to put out there that uh, uh, for the attendees, we have our next uh, session uh, on February 18th. Uh, again, uh, same ATARC time, same ATARC channel uh, with uh, Nancy Gillis, who is the CEO of the Green Electronics Council. So bringing kind of sustainability in, uh, into the modernization conversation. Um, John, this has been, as always, I always enjoy our conversations and uh, very helpful. And, and uh, again, uh, I'm going to put one uh, comment out there. There was, you know, kind of a, a question around uh, uh, needing a little bit more help on, on um, uh, you know, uh, some guidance. ATARC has a number of working groups. Uh, reach out to Kirsten or Nicole. Uh, to uh, to feel free to jump into those with uh, a number of uh, experts from uh, you know uh, academia industry and uh, and government. But uh, John, thank you very much, and uh, really enjoyed.
Yeah, thank you guys. Okay, all of our panelists, please smile for the camera and I'm gonna take your photo in one, two, three. <laughs> thank you guys. <laughs> Thanks everybody. John, great time. Bill, always enjoy it. Kirsten, Nicole, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank, thank you all. Week.